This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Unless indicated, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When your job takes you high above the ground, every workday is hazardous. Who rescues the risk takers when they are in trouble? I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of danger and the courageous people who save our lives on Rescue 911. We begin in Jacksonville, Florida, nearly 200 feet above the St. John's River. Though actors have helped to set the scene for the story, almost all of the footage you will see was taped during a daring rescue attempt May 15th of this year. The Dames Point Bridge in Jacksonville, Florida had only just opened. Sam Martin and Kimberly Brooks were making the final inspection. For the 23-year-old engineer trainee, it was her first bridge inspection. And they had been telling me about the inspections and heights, and I was afraid. But, you know, instructor, you deal with height bridges. So I said I might as well go ahead and do it and not seem like a sissy. Sam maneuvered the bucket over the side of the bridge and down underneath it. Suspended 175 feet above the river, Sam, Kim, and two consulting company engineers were searching the underside of the bridge for cracks and fissures. When the safety mechanism suddenly shut down the engine, driver Chester Taylor went to see what the problem was. The 34-foot boom arm had broken at the elbow joint and was hanging by one pin. The bucket was on its side, almost upside down. Engineer Bob Farley had been thrown 140 feet down into the river. Engineer Bruce Boyle was left dangling five feet below the bucket from his safety belt. Kim and Sam were still in the bucket, trying to hold on. I didn't know if the rest of that boom was going to go or not, and... Uh... What, what the circumstances were. I saw it swinging. I knew something had broken, and, and, I, and it was just hanging there, and I didn't know what kind of support was left. We got emergency out here. A man in the water, the boom broke. The first call for help came in at 10.15 a.m. Rescue Jordan, can I help you? Yes, I have an emergency at the Dane Point uh, construct, Bridge Construction site. What's wrong? Uh, I only have a confused account so far. A, a guy hanging on to a bucket dropped in the river. And what side of the bridge is he on? Which direction? North side. He's on the north side of the bridge. Is he near the end or near the span? Near the main span. We'll be there in a minute. 10-4. Jacksonville Fire Rescue Units fire were dispatched to the scene. Fire 2, rescue watching Bruce's eyes just roll back in his head and you can tell he was in pain. He was trying to pull up and I knew he couldn't pull up because the way he was hanging. Bob Farley had somehow managed to hit the water feet first. He escaped from his 14-story fall with only a dislocated shoulder. Up on the bridge, help had arrived, but none of the rescue vehicles could reach down to the victims. It seemed like we had been up there for hours and my arm went numb and you try to shake it and then you just felt like I might as well fall out. You know, I didn't know how much more I could take. The first attempt to repel down to the victims was quickly aborted. Chief Napoli decided it would be safer to send someone more experienced. Paramedic Randy Fulford had trained for high angle rescues by repelling up and down City Hall with the SWAT team. On the Dane's Point Bridge. Rescue 18 will respond to the incident on the bridge lights. Sorry. Oh, 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 oh. 
there's just a small rope between you and sudden death in most cases like that. So knots have to be tied accurately. Rigging has to be properly applied. High winds made it too dangerous to try to rappel straight down to the bucket. Chief Napoli and I decided that I would climb down the actual arm of the apparatus, the extension that held the bucket that the people were actually suspended in. When we first decided that, somebody brought up the security and stability of the boom. Was that a good idea to get on it with them? We might actually load it, causing it to, to completely sever from its attachment and fall into the river. But if we couldn't get to them, we weren't going to do them any good. So we just made the best call we could. When I saw him climbing down the boom, I thought he's going to risk his life also because I didn't know how much weight it could take. As I descended the boom, it became increasingly slick because of all the hydraulic fluid that had been sprayed all over it. I had a very poor footing, very, very poor handhold. One of my primary objectives when I first reached the patients was, number one, to reassure them. Then, if I had to divert my attention at that time to the gentleman that was actually suspended, because I felt that he was in the most distress at that point, the most danger. Tell me when you're ready to bring him up, Randy. I'm ready. You ready? Yeah. Come on. 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 Randy strapped Bruce in a safety harness and attached it to a pulley system. I signaled for them to haul him up. At that point, I had no control over his rope. He was totally in the people on the top's hands at that time. Bruce Boyle was safe, emerging from the incident with only a cracked vertebra. As I secured Kim to a more safe attachment, I was notified from the people up top that Harry Whidden was coming down to help me. Now that there was one less victim weighing down the crippled boom arm, it was safe for another rescuer to come down and help. Kim, like Bruce before her, was given a choice. Be raised 34 feet to the bridge or lowered 140 feet to a boat. After more than an hour suspended over the river, she too chose to be hoisted up. Two. 
After one and a half hours, the last victim, Sam Martin, was pulled to safety. My first thought when I heard the snap of the boom was, did I go to college for this? Did I actually go to school for this? This is not happening to me. Just the inside knowledge, knowing that I helped somebody else live a more productive life, maybe a longer life, it means a lot to me. Kim Brooks will finish her trainee program and become an engineer three years from now. None of her plans for the future have changed. The accident on the Danes Point Bridge happened about four months prior to Clem and I getting married. Kim, here's Ling Ling, the ugly teddy bear. The first thought that came to my mind as I was hanging there was somebody else marrying Clem on our wedding day. And that gave me a little bit of inspiration to hold on. I hate to say, but sometimes it almost takes something, you know, devastating or to a near fatal accident or something to really make you realize what you have because it seems that you always take one another for granted. But now, since this has happened, you know, that's my girl. She, mm -mm. The only thing that break us up is death. <laughs> Next. Thank you, Police Fire Communications. <laughs> If someone you love is caught in an emergency, will you know enough to be able to help? That moment came for one mother on May 16, 1988, in the small town of Xenia, Ohio. All of the people involved have returned to help us tell her story. Every day, Jean Collins looks after her seven-year-old nephew, Brad his younger sister, and her own 12-month-old daughter, Amanda. On this day, Amanda had an ear infection. As the day progressed, her fever began to get higher. Amanda started to cry, and, and I went to pick her up, and, and, and uh, that's when uh, I, I called the doctor's office, and Amanda started uh, going into her convulsion. When I talked to the nurse then, she said, hang up and call an ambulance. 911 was all I could think. But Xenia had no 911 system. The nearest available 911 operator was 60 miles away in Cincinnati. She routed the call back to Xenia's one emergency dispatcher, Jay Smith. Xenia Police Fire Communications. What's the address, ma'am? just a desperation in her voice that I'd never dealt with before, and it got my attention. I felt that I couldn't leave this lady. I had to deal with her and stay on the line with her no matter what. Okay. Okay, get your baby on the back and make sure that there's nothing in the throat. Okay. Okay. 1547. Ma'am, they're on the way. Tilt the head back. Place your mouth over the baby's nose and mouth. Okay. And breathe in. Breathe in until the chest rises. What's the matter now, ma'am? Ma'am? She's not doing anything. Okay. Ma'am? When my Aunt Jean started screaming about Amanda, I got real um, sad and I thought she was going to die. Listen to me, ma'am. Ma'am? Listen to me, ma'am. Okay. You're going to have to try to clear the baby's throat. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, listen to me. Amanda. 1311, 1321. Ma'am. I can't hear you. Okay, listen to oh, me, please. Okay, you're going to have to get the baby's throat clear. Tilt the head back. Tilt the head back so fast. Okay, try to pull the timer up with your fingers. I can't. I can't hold the phone.
happened to you? Okay, well, just go ahead and try that. Lay the phone down and then come back to me, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Patricia Schinkel had just finished her shift as a nurse at a local hospital. I was on my way home from work to pick up my children at my sister's house, and I noticed an ambulance, and Lee and Michelle had just gotten home also, and they were getting out of their car. The ambulance pulled in front of the house, and I figure it has to be one of the three kids. It's all right. You're going to be okay. There you go. You're doing fine. It's okay, baby. I'm sorry. Here, she's a nurse. Okay. That's good. You guys got somebody that can open the door for the firefighters? Yeah. Okay. They're here. Okay. Just go ahead and you can take her to them, okay? All right. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Amanda's high fever had caused the convulsions. Until the airway was unblocked, she could not get any oxygen in, not even with artificial respiration. Okay. Amanda had stopped breathing, but when examined at the hospital, she seemed to have suffered no ill effects. A year later, Amanda is a normal, healthy two-year-old. What Amanda had was a fever convulsion or a febrile seizure. Although this type of seizure is relatively common, the type of respiratory disturbance that Amanda had is very unusual. The Collins family has kept in touch with dispatcher Jay Smith. Jay is so special. The city recognized him for what he did, and they invited us to come and see him receive his commendation. And it was like seeing a friend or somebody when I saw him and they said, this is Jay Smith. I, I hugged him and I said, thank you. you know, he's, so, he's so wonderful. He um, was so patient on the phone. Continually, I think now, what if he hadn't kept telling me, you know, check her throat, check her throat, calm down. He, he stayed with me totally through the whole thing. He was like, that phone was like, it was like my lifeline, you know, my connection to somebody else who was helping me. I, I can't describe how special he is. Next. We always had a fear of the tracks. In the back of your mind, uh, you always think, God, I just hope these kids always learn that they never should go there. Ramsey, New Jersey, the kind of town where nothing much ever happens. But on Monday, May 1st of this year, something frightening did. Most of the people involved have returned to help us reconstruct the events of that spring morning.
Conductor Anthony Falzer was on a short haul from New York to New Jersey with his engineer, Richard Campana. We had 19 loaded cars, one engine. We were eastbound on New Jersey Transit, approaching Ramsey. Kate Pritchard was just returning home from doing errands in town. My usual deal on Monday mornings is to do my grocery shopping, so I packed up the kids in the car and we went to the grocery store and came home. I guess it was about a quarter of 11 when we came home. When Kate and her husband Gary were looking for a safe neighborhood in which to raise a family, this place had seemed perfect. We live in a cul-de-sac with many, many children and they're always playing out there. Uh, knowing that they're not allowed in the woods, knowing that they're not allowed to even go near the train tracks at all. Kate trusted her older son, Todd, to look after his younger brother, Scott, while she took the groceries into the house. There is such an amazing difference between these two boys. Todd has always been very cautious and uh, more intense. I mean, if since he was little, if you told him, don't touch that because you will be hurt if you do, he wouldn't. And then there's Scott. Uh, I think if I had had Scott first, I probably wouldn't have had another one until Scott was in college. He's fearless. He's just basically fearless. And the tracks are temptingly close, less than 300 feet from the Pritchard family home. We always had a fear of the tracks. In the back of your mind, uh, you always think, God, I just hope these kids always learn that they never should go there. But on this morning, they did. One and a half year old Scott and three year old Todd made their way through the woods to play on the tracks just beyond. They saw something moving and it moved like a, something alive, not like wind blowing something or, you know, something like that. Whatever it was, we were going to hit. When that train whistle just, I guess the engineer just let his hand down on that whistle and it just kept flowing. I just had this horrible gut feeling that something was definitely wrong with the boys. The train was slowing down, but it didn't appear to me that we were going to stop in time. I could not get out there fast enough. I mean, those legs of mine just moved not fast enough. And I got out to the end of the driveway, and the whole time I was running out there, I was screaming for Todd, just screaming out his name. I lost view from the front of the engine. I can't see directly down in front of me. The wide snow plow on the front of the train had only 12 inches of clearance. Even with the brakes on, the weight of the 250-ton train carried it more than 100 feet past where the boys were playing on the tracks. As soon as the train stopped, I jumped off to see what happened, to see if Tony was all right. I thought the little boy was killed. Rich, go back and call the dispatch. Tell me to police and an ambulance. Okay. I just remember seeing the snow plow the locomotive hit the smallest child in the head. You know, I just automatically thought this kid had a severe head injury. Oh, my God, what happened? Anthony Fowler was screaming at me. To go call an ambulance, I wanted him to go get the ambulance. But uh, at that point, my, I just knew that someone had to go get help. At 11.05 a.m., the call for help came in. Okay, well, she's on Fifteen way. year veteran Glenn Karpovich was the first officer on the scene. When I heard the call, I expected the worst. Normally, a person involved with it trained any degree, it's a fatal accident. I dialed my husband and I said, uh, Scott was hit by a train. And I said, just get home as fast as you can. I did not know the danger of uh, what state this baby was in. 
smoke is coming from his nose, from his mouth, and the top of his head. Okay. And he said, we got to get you to the hospital. I'm like, please just wait a few more minutes for my husband, knowing that if he got there and saw us gone, the poor guy would have just fallen apart. I wanted him there with me. And you're running all these kind of scenarios. What happened? What went wrong? How did, what was he doing there? Where, where, where was everybody? When the paramedics arrived, Scott was taken to the hospital for examination. All right, let's go in the front. We're going to leave. It'll be all right. It'll be fine. After six stitches on the forehead and seven on the chin, Scott was released. Miraculously, neither boy was seriously injured. My only uh, thing to say to other mothers is that if you're living in a situation where you have a uh, train track near you, or you're living by a busy road, don't wait for something like this to occur before you put up a fence. If I had turned the other way and I had gotten to those train tracks and it had, uh, Anthony Faldo hadn't been on that train or it hadn't gone the way it did, uh, I probably would have laid down and waited for the next train. It snapped my priorities in line in like 20 seconds, where, you know, you get so wrapped up in the day-to-day, -day, oh, you know, if you, 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 the uh, success thing with your business and to providing for your family and this, and all of a sudden it was just like, whew, there is nothing but the family. All right, let's see if we can get one all the way back by those guys. Well, we've, we've basically adopted a conductor. I told Gary he had to put an extension on the house. <laughs> we now have a third son, <laughs> and he's become a big part of our lives, and he will always be a big part of our lives. I think we've become very close, and uh, I think that's the best reward of everything. I don't have any children, so it made me see that we tend to overlook things because a lot of people tend to be so concerned about themselves. And I said, well, if I was killed and the two children lived, that's the way I would have wanted it because I'm 35 years old. I've done a lot in my life and I still have a lot of my life left, but these children have their entire life left. My first impression of looking at the car was it's hard to believe that anyone come out of that car alive. Twenty-four hours a day, doctors, nurses, and technicians battle against the clock to save the lives of unknown victims of devastating accidents and violent crimes. What you're about to see is not a recreation. It's one story from the late night shift at R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. Howard County 911, can you complete the fire department or an ambulance? We need medical emergency and police. There's a terrible accident on Fire Quarter and Carroll Mill. Howard County, normal one. Yeah, somebody's laying on the ground, looks quite injured. Rescue alarm 31, station 3, engine fire well alerted for personal injury accident. A small car had gone out of control and crashed into a telephone pole. Uh, myself was the third police car on the scene. My first impression of looking at the car was it's hard to believe that anyone come out of that car alive. You could practically stick your head through the driver's door by the telephone pole and stick it out the passenger side. It was so close. The seats was practically on top of each other. It's probably going to be one of the worst that I've seen anyone live out of. En route, the paramedics called the trauma center. We're en route to Shock Trauma, priority one, ETA, at 20.5 minutes. Dr. Brad Cushing is the trauma surgeon on call. They don't call you for the easy ones. It's difficult. I'm not there at the scene. Can't see what it is that they're telling me. Um, and I'm the one who has to make the decision. The victim is the 17-year-old driver. Though critically injured, Chad Ritchie had crawled out of the crushed car before the paramedics could reach him. What mic is it? Some eyes. Some eyes. Are you breathing okay? I'm starting to die. Huh? 
Am I? Yeah, you. I'm going fast. Okay, slow it down. Do you have any pain in your chest? Squeeze my uh -huh. hand. Yeah. One, two, three. Let me have your arm here, buddy. 18 minutes more fast. How you doing? Are you okay? You're in the hospital now, hon. You're in the trauma center. Yeah, I know. You're okay. 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 Ok
God, don't say anything. I just get well. Can you hear me? Chad, I love you, darling, and I want to take care of you. Okay. And you're going to be okay, honey. Just take some real good care of you. Okay? You hear me, darling? Just get well quick. Our role in, uh, in treating Chad is to, is to treat not just his injuries, but also to try and treat the fact that uh, he'll be out driving again someday, and uh, it's our hopes that he won't uh, won't drink and drive again. You want to write something? It's my it's my own Chad. Chad, I told you before, people make mistakes, okay? I mean, don't blame yourself. Just be, just be thankful that you're alive. I am. I wouldn't put the blame now on someone else, because as soon as they see a beer with a teenager, I mean, who's going to get blamed? You know? I said, I hope you kids understand. I mean, here's a good friend got hurt. Is the one beer that important? <laughs> Stupid. Don't even drink and draw. Don't even... It's stupid. It's, it's not mine. It's stupid. This time, Chad Ritchie's broken bones will mend, and life will go on without a spleen. I'm looking forward to just having things get back to normal again, having us fight over trivial things, seeing his friends come back and forth, hearing the phone ring, and not having to say Chad's in the hospital. That's what I'm looking forward to, things going back to normal, because normal, the way it was, looks pretty good now. Next. I thought he was faking it at first, even though I saw the electricity. On May 27th of this year, 16-year-old Scooter Green was cleaning his family's pool when his longtime friend, 14-year-old Robbie Henderson, dropped by. I was cutting through Scooter's yard to go to my house, and I saw him clean the pool. Though so actors portray the Greens, the rest of the people involved have returned to help us tell Scooter's story. Sounds good. You want to go? Yeah. Get some pool. All right. I thought he was faking it at first, even though I saw the electricity. Scooter? He started going under, so I looked for anything that could be electrocuting still, and then I, I just grabbed his hair. I knew that something really bad had happened. Calvin! Calvin! Scooter's mother, Sarah Green, ran to the house to get help from her friend, Calvin. I forgot a lot of what happened after that because I was in shock. He was wheezing and gasping, trying to get air, and his body was very rigid. I felt confused, you know, I wasn't too sure what to do. I saw that no one was calling 911, so I figured that's the first thing to do. You can find him at what's emergency. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, somebody touched the electrical wire with the pool car. Uh -huh. It's an emergency. Definitely emergency. He fell down and collapsed. All right, so is he? He's very conscious. Uh, Tommy, yeah. I'm going to get you some help out there. Yeah. How old is he? Uh, he's 16. Operator D.W. Mills passed the address to Jack Williams for immediate dispatch. MS-50, engine 4, 16-year-old male, unconscious, electrical shock, 9619, full Kindle tree, near Majestic Oaks, MS-50, engine 4, 16-year-old male. From the nearest fire station, an engine headed to the scene. At the same time, from a centralized location twice as far away, an advanced life support ambulance was launched. Yes, sir. Aluminum pole. Aluminum, okay. What is your name? Uh, Robbie Henderson. I'm living across the street from him. His mom uh, helped him out there. After Robbie had gone to call 911, Scooter's breathing was getting more and more shallow. So I set up to administer back pressure arm lift method of artificial respiration. Okay, is he breathing and conscious now? Yes, he, he, he's half and half. Uh, uh, he's half and half. Gentlemen, we got units en route. Okay. If you need any more help, give us a call right back. Yes, sir. When I got off the phone, I was about to faint. Miss Green and Calvin were in the backyard with Scooter, so 
I went across the street. I just kept telling myself he was going to be okay, but I had doubts in my mind. <laughs> I thought we were doing all right, Scooter and I, so I decided to try rolling him over, and much to my horror, uh, his lips were very deep blue, his face was ashen, and his body seemed just very limp. And it was really at that point when it occurred to me that, that Scooter could actually die. When I started administering the full CPR routine, something just told me that was right. My attention was riveted on Scooter. Everything else around me was locked out. It was a very helpless feeling, knowing that there was very little I could do when I wanted to do so much. Five minutes after the call was made, two emergency medical technicians from the fire station arrived on the scene. When we first arrived, and we saw the young man laying on the ground. He was motionless. He was turning blue. He had no pulse. He was not breathing. And it didn't look very good. Stop breathing for me. Thank you. Check the pulse. Okay. Has 50. We have planning in effect. 50 dispatcher, I need a channel. Talk with engine four. Engine four, meet ambulance 50 on A Alpha 2. This is engine 4A. We have a 16 year old down, not breathing. A CPR in progress. The emergency medical technician Doug Lewis took over, giving the boy chest compressions. Still no blood pressure. Ma'am, you need to get back. Yeah, Scooter's back mother was standing there. And I was scared for her to see somebody doing chest compressions. It's just kind of like hitting you with a ton of bricks saying, Your son is dead. Eight minutes after Scooter was electrocuted, the paramedics arrived with full life support equipment. The power line Scooter had electrocuted himself on was the main line into the subdivision. The electricity had passed down his body to the ground, stopping his heart. The situation was extremely dangerous for Scooter. If the electricity had gone through the body, it can damage the heart, the lungs, all the vital organs. It can literally destroy everything in there. Continue CPR. CPR is only a stopgap measure. If his heart isn't shocked into beating again, he will die. Okay, everybody clear? Continue CPR. Seeing him lie there, not knowing if he was going to live or die, was um, a very overwhelming feeling. Come on, Scooter. Come on. I just told him to come on, that he was going to make it, because he hasn't done the things that he wants to do. You have a beat yet? We got a pulse. We got a pulse. Okay. Right. Scooter. We got it. Come on. We got it. When you start getting the pulse and stuff come back, it's it's elation. It's an unbelievable, exciting feeling knowing that you did your job and it works. They had him stabilized enough to move him to the ambulance. Then it really hit me as to what had happened and what could have happened and got a mild case of the shakes. Electricity had killed him. Electricity had brought him back. As the situation improved and improved, we kept thinking, hey, we got the one in a million is going to make it. After five days in the hospital, Scooter Green was released. Though he could remember almost nothing about the incident, he had suffered no long-term effects. I just remember lying on my back, and I remember pain. The pain was so bad that I just wanted to go ahead and die. And everybody was sitting there telling me, hang in, you're going to make it, you're going to make it. The happiest moment for me was when Scooter called the next day. And also, when he came home, knocked on my door. <laughs> I helped a friend out, and maybe someday, if I was in trouble, a friend would help me out, too. Within a month, Sarah Green had convinced the power company to raise the lines above the pool another 20 feet. My greatest joy is that uh, he's alive, and there is no heart damage, there is no brain damage. 
and I'm um, so thankful that they knew what they were doing, and it worked so well that day. <laughs> Two weeks after it happened, Scooter came by the fire station. It was amazing. I just couldn't believe that he was up and walking around. He should have been dead. He should have been six feet under. It was definitely a miracle. It wasn't his time. I think we're all even now. Uh, not quite. Oh. Yeah.